In this episode, we embark on a journey back to the idyllic landscapes of the 1960s, where the Stainer family resided in the heart of Merced, California. It was an era of innocence, a time when neighborhoods were tight-knit communities, and children roamed the streets until the streetlights flickered on. Meet the Stainers, a seemingly ordinary family with extraordinary tales to tell. At the center of it all were two brothers, Carrie and Stephen, aged eleven and seven respectively, amidst their siblings. But before their stories diverged into the realms of darkness and light, they were just two young boys navigating the trials and triumphs of childhood in rural America, among their four siblings. Carrie, the eldest, aged eleven, was a spirited and adventurous soul, always eager to explore the world beyond their backyard. And then there was Stephen, gentle, compassionate, aged seven, with a heart as vast as the starry skies above. Their bond was unbreakable, forged through years of shared laughter and whispered dreams. Little did they know, their innocence would soon be shattered, and their lives forever changed. Join us as we delve into the untold stories of Carrie and Stephen Stainer, a journey that will take us from the sun-drenched days of youth to the shadows of unimaginable tragedy. On the afternoon of December 4, 1972, seven-year-old Stephen Stainer was approached by a man named Irvin Edward Murphy while walking home from school. Murphy, who had been enlisted by Kenneth Parnell, engaged Stephen in conversation under false pretenses. Despite Stephen's innocence, he agreed to accompany Murphy to his home. Unbeknownst to Stephen, Murphy's intentions were sinister. Parnell awaited in a white Buick nearby, ready to whisk Stephen away to his cabin in Caffey's Valley. Once there, Parnell subjected Stephen to unspeakable acts of molestation and abuse, forever altering the course of his life. Over time, Parnell manipulated Stephen into believing he had legal custody, renaming him Dennis Gregory Parnell and forcing him to live as his son. Despite Stephen's repeated attempts to escape, Parnell's deception kept him captive for over seven years. Parnell passed himself off as Stainer's father, and the two moved frequently around California, living in locations including Santa Rosa and Compchi. Parnell allowed Stainer to begin drinking at a young age and to come and go virtually as he pleased. As he frequently moved from one menial job to another, some of his work required travel and leaving Stainer unguarded. An adult Stainer later remarked that he could have easily used these absences as opportunities to flee, but was unaware how to summon help. During his captivity, amidst the darkness and abuse, there were a few glimmers of light for Stainer. One such beacon of solace was a gift from Parnell, a Manchester terrier named Queenie. The dog provided Stainer with a source of companionship and comfort, a loyal friend in a world filled with uncertainty and fear. Queenie became a constant presence in Stainer's life, offering him a sense of normalcy amid the chaos orchestrated by Parnell. However, even amid the semblance of normalcy, Stainer's ordeal continued. For a period of 18 months, a woman named Barbara Matthias resided with Parnell and Stainer. Tragically, Matthias became complicit in Stainer's abuse, participating alongside Parnell in unspeakable acts of violence against the young boy. Stainer later recounted enduring abuse at Matthias' hands on nine occasions at the tender age of nine, further compounding his trauma. In 1975, Parnell instructed Matthias to attempt to lure another young boy, who attended the Santa Rosa Boys Club with Stainer, into his car. Thankfully, this attempt was unsuccessful, sparing another child from the horrors of captivity. It's important to note that Matthias later claimed to have been completely unaware of the true nature of Stainer's situation, oblivious to the fact that Dennis had been kidnapped and held against his will. The presence of Queenie, while offering some respite, couldn't erase the scars of Stainer's captivity. His bond with the loyal terrier served as a reminder of the fleeting moments of joy amid the darkness, as he endured unimaginable suffering at the hands of those he trusted. While Stephen endured the harrowing ordeal of captivity under Kenneth Parnell, his brother Carrie was left to grapple with the agonizing uncertainty of his siblings' fate. As the days turned into months and the months into years, the Stainer family's anguish deepened, their hopes of Stephen's safe return fading with each passing day. Carrie, the elder brother, felt the weight of responsibility on his young shoulders. With Stephen's absence casting a shadow over their family, Carrie became determined to fill the void left by his brother's disappearance. Yet, 
Amidst his outward strength and resolve, Kerry wrestled with his own inner turmoil, haunted by the unanswered questions surrounding Stephen's abduction. As Stainer transitioned into adolescence, Kenneth Parnell's sinister intentions took a darker turn. Parnell, fueled by his predatory desires, began scouring for a new victim, seeking a younger child to abduct and subject to his heinous whims. Despite previous unsuccessful attempts to enlist Stainer's help in these nefarious schemes, Parnell persisted in his pursuit, believing Stainer lacked the resolve to be an accomplice. Unbeknownst to Parnell, Stainer had been silently resisting his manipulative tactics all along. Despite being coerced into participating in previous failed kidnapping attempts, Stainer deliberately sabotaged these efforts, covertly thwarting Parnell's plans in a desperate bid to protect potential victims. However, the turning point came on February 14, 1980, when Parnell, accompanied by a teenage acquaintance of Stainer named Randall Sean Poorman, abducted five-year-old Timothy White in Ukiah. Witnessing the distress of the young boy ignited something within Stainer, a spark of compassion and empathy that had long been suppressed under the weight of his own suffering. In an act of extraordinary courage, Stainer made the fateful decision to intervene. On March 1, 1980, seizing an opportunity while Parnell was away at his night security job, Stainer fled the house with White and hitchhiked into Ukiah. Despite their initial struggle to locate White's residence, they eventually found refuge at a local police station. By daybreak on March 2, 1980, Parnell's reign of terror had come to a dramatic end. Arrested on suspicion of abducting both boys, Parnell's dark secrets were finally brought to light. A subsequent investigation into his background revealed a previous conviction for sodomy dating back to 1951, further underscoring the depravity of his character. Both Timothy White and Stainer were joyously reunited with their families, their harrowing ordeal finally at an end. Parnell, however, faced justice for his crimes. Convicted in 1981 of kidnapping both White and Stainer, he was sentenced to seven years in prison, although he was paroled after serving just five. Despite the overwhelming evidence of his monstrous deeds, Parnell escaped prosecution for the numerous sexual assaults perpetrated against Stainer and other boys. The jurisdictional constraints and statute of limitations proved insurmountable hurdles for prosecutors, leaving many of Parnell's victims without closure or justice. Even as the legal proceedings unfolded, Stainer harbored a complex array of emotions towards those involved in his ordeal. He remembered the fleeting moments of kindness shown by Irvin Edward Murphy, whom he referred to as Uncle Murphy, during their shared captivity. Stainer believed that Murphy, like himself and Timothy White, had fallen prey to Parnell's manipulative influence. Stainer's kidnapping and its aftermath prompted California lawmakers to change state laws to allow consecutive prison terms in similar abduction cases. After reuniting with his family, Stephen faced tremendous challenges readjusting to a structured home life. His years of captivity under Parnell had left deep psychological scars, making it difficult for him to fit into the familiar routines of family life. In an interview with Newsweek shortly after his return, Stephen expressed feeling like he was being treated as a child again, rather than the grown man he had become. This disconnection led to confusion and resentment, as he questioned whether his decision to come home had been the right one. Despite some brief counseling, Stephen refrained from seeking further help and kept many details of his abuse from Parnell hidden. The lack of support and understanding from his family, particularly his father, exacerbated his emotional turmoil, contributing to struggles with mental health and relationships. The aftermath of his abduction profoundly altered Stephen's trajectory. He faced bullying at school and turned to alcohol as a coping mechanism, further straining his already troubled relationship with his father and eventually leading to his expulsion from the family home. Despite these challenges, Stephen found purpose and comfort in his role as a husband and father. In 1985, he married Jody Edmondson, and together they had two children, Ashley and Stephen Jr. Despite his own trauma, Stephen dedicated himself to raising awareness of child abduction and safety, drawing from his own experiences to help others. Stephen's journey toward healing took a spiritual turn when he joined the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints shortly before his tragic death. On September 16, 1989, 
he was fatally injured in a hit-and-run accident while riding his motorcycle home from work. The driver, Antonio Lora, was later identified but received a lenient sentence. Stephen's funeral was attended by hundreds, including Timothy White, the boy he had rescued from captivity, serving as a poignant reminder of Stephen's courage and compassion. Carrie Stainer's struggles continued long after the return and tragic death of his brother, Stephen. Feeling overlooked and neglected amidst the intense media attention surrounding Stephen's escape and subsequent return, Carrie grappled with his own sense of identity and purpose. The spotlight that once again shone on Stephen with the release of a television miniseries based on his harrowing experience, titled I Know My First Name Is Stephen, only served to deepen Carrie's feelings of insignificance. Despite graduating, Carrie found himself stuck in a dead end job as a window installer at a glass company. It was during this time that Carrie's troubled mind began to unravel, consumed by dark and violent fantasies. In a chilling revelation, it emerged that Carrie harbored a disturbing fantasy of committing a mass murder suicide at his workplace. The thought of ramming a truck into the business, killing everyone inside, and setting the building ablaze consumed his thoughts, signaling a dangerous descent into the depths of his psyche. In 1991, Carrie's inner turmoil reached a breaking point when he attempted to take his own life by gassing himself with carbon monoxide. The failed suicide attempt marked a turning point in Carrie's downward spiral, leading to his admission to a mental institution in 1995 after claiming to have suffered a nervous breakdown. Though he received treatment and was eventually released, Carrie's mental health remained fragile, teetering on the brink of collapse. Despite his struggles with mental illness, Carrie's troubles extended beyond his internal battles. In 1997, he faced legal troubles after being arrested for possession of marijuana and methamphetamines. However, these charges were later dropped, adding another layer of complexity to Carrie's tumultuous life. In 1997, Stainer was hired as a handyman at the Cedar Lodge Motel in El Portal, California, just outside the Highway 140 entrance to Yosemite National Park. Stainer found all of his confirmed victims at the Cedar Lodge Motel. Between February and July 1999, he murdered at least two women and two teenagers. As the investigation progressed, Stainer's demeanor began to raise suspicions among law enforcement officials. Despite his outward calmness, subtle inconsistencies in his behavior and statements caught the attention of detectives, prompting them to delve deeper into his background. Stainer's troubled history, marked by struggles with mental illness and brushes with the law, began to draw scrutiny. Although he had no prior criminal convictions, his troubled past and unsettling interactions with law enforcement raised red flags among investigators. These factors, combined with his proximity to the victims, led authorities to consider him as a potential suspect in the brutal triple homicide. Detectives meticulously pieced together evidence and interviewed witnesses, and Stainer's role in the case became increasingly scrutinized. Despite initially flying under the radar, his connection to the victims and the unsettling details surrounding his interactions with law enforcement painted a disturbing picture that couldn't be ignored. Despite the horror and shock rippling through the community, law enforcement remained determined to unravel the truth behind the brutal murders of Carol Sund, Sylvina Palasso, and Julie Sund. Stainer's evolving role in the investigation would soon thrust him into the spotlight, casting a dark shadow over his troubled past and raising questions about his involvement in the heinous crimes. This continuation delves into the suspicion surrounding Carrie Stainer and the investigation of the triple homicide, highlighting the intensifying scrutiny of his actions and background by law enforcement. The discovery of Joie Ruth Armstrong's decapitated body sent shockwaves through the community further intensifying the already palpable fear and unease. As investigators combed through the evidence, a disturbing pattern began to emerge, linking Carrie Stainer to yet another gruesome murder. Eyewitness accounts provided crucial leads, with reports of a distinctive blue 1972 International Scout scene parked outside the cabin where Armstrong had been staying the day before her body was found. Detectives wasted no time in tracing this vehicle back to Stainer, marking a significant breakthrough in the case. Armed with this newfound evidence, FBI agents John Bowles and Jeff Rinek launched a relentless manhunt for Stainer, tracking him to the Laguna del Sol nudist resort in Wilton. 
there, amidst the serene backdrop of the resort, Stainer was apprehended without incident and transported to Sacramento for questioning. During the interrogation that followed, Stainer stunned the agents with a chilling confession. Not only did he admit to the brutal murder of Joa Ruth Armstrong, but he also confessed to the killings of Sylvina Palazzo, Carol Sund, and Julie Sund. His admission sent shockwaves through law enforcement circles confirming their worst fears about the true extent of Stainer's depravity. Further incriminating evidence was uncovered when Stainer's vehicle yielded crucial forensic clues linking him directly to Armstrong's murder. The pieces of the puzzle were finally falling into place, revealing the full extent of Stainer's reign of terror. Despite widespread speculation that the trauma of his brother's abduction may have played a role in Carey's descent into sexual deviancy, his assertion that he had harbored fantasies of abducting and murdering women since the tender age of seven presented a chilling new perspective. Kerry Stainer's admission that he exposed himself to his sister's friend while she was staying over at his house added another disturbing layer to his predatory behavior. Stainer's trial in federal court for Joie Ruth Armstrong's murder, which occurred on federal land, marked a pivotal moment in the legal proceedings against him. In a strategic move to avoid the possibility of a death sentence, Stainer made the decision to plead guilty to a range of charges, including premeditated first-degree murder, felony first-degree murder, kidnapping resulting in death, and attempted aggravated sexual abuse resulting in death. During the sentencing hearing, Stainer stunned the courtroom with a rare display of emotion. Breaking down in tears, he offered a heartfelt apology to the victims and their families. I wish I could take it back, but I can't, he lamented. I wish I could tell you why I did such a thing, but I don't even know myself. I'm so sorry. I wish there was a reason. But there isn't. It's senseless. His sincere remorse deeply affected those present, with Armstrong's mother moved to tears by his unexpected display of contrition. She later expressed her belief that Stainer's apology was genuine. Despite Stainer's plea for leniency, the severity of his crimes could not be ignored. He was ultimately sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole for Armstrong's murder. In contrast, Stainer chose to plead not guilty by reason of insanity to the other murders in state court. His defense team argued that the Stainer family's history of sexual abuse and mental illness had contributed to his actions pointing to evidence of obsessive-compulsive disorder and his disturbing request for child pornography in exchange for his confession. Despite these claims, Stainer was found sane and convicted of three counts of first-degree murder with special circumstances, as well as one count of kidnapping, by a jury on August 27, 2002. He was subsequently sentenced to death for the killings. Since his sentencing, Stainer has been housed at the Adjustment Center on death row at San Quentin State Prison. Despite being on death row, there have been no executions in California since a 2006 court ruling highlighting flaws in the administration of capital punishment in the state. Stainer's fate remains uncertain, with the legal process surrounding his case mired in complex legal challenges and ongoing debates over the ethics and efficacy of the death penalty in California. In conclusion, the case of Carrie Stainer presents a stark juxtaposition between two brothers who experienced similar traumatic events yet took vastly different paths in life. While Stephen Stainer emerged as a hero, displaying remarkable resilience and courage in the face of adversity by rescuing another child from captivity, Carrie's story took a darker turn. The trauma of Stephen's abduction undoubtedly had a profound impact on Carrie leaving psychological scars that may have contributed to his descent into criminal behavior. However, it's crucial to recognize that external factors alone cannot fully account for the actions of individuals like Carrie, who exhibit a disturbing propensity for violence from a young age. Even in the face of excessive abuse, Stephen chose a path of bravery and altruism, demonstrating that resilience and inner strength can prevail even in the most harrowing of circumstances. His actions serve as a powerful reminder of the human capacity for heroism and redemption. The contrasting paths of the Stainer brothers highlight the complexities inherent in understanding criminal behavior and the importance of early intervention and support for individuals grappling with trauma and mental illness. It underscores the need for comprehensive measures to address the root causes of violence within society, while also celebrating the resilience and courage of those, 
like Steven Stainer, who refused to be defined by their past. The boy rescued by Steven Stainer, Timothy White, forged a profound friendship with his savior, born from shared trauma and resilience. Following his rescue, White found solace and purpose in joining law enforcement, becoming a respected Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department deputy in 2005. Like Stainer, he dedicated himself to educating children about the dangers of kidnapping, drawing from his own harrowing experience. In 2004, White was called to testify in the trial of Kenneth Parnell for human trafficking and attempted kidnapping, a moment that brought unexpected reunions. Sean Poorman, an adult at the time, expressed shock upon seeing White, their first encounter since the 1980 kidnapping. Despite the past, they reconciled, sharing a brief conversation and a heartfelt hug. White found love and started a family with his wife Dina, but tragically passed away on April 1, 2010, from a pulmonary embolism. In honor of their enduring bond and heroic actions, a statue commemorating White and Stainer was dedicated in Applegate Park in Merced on August 28, 2010. Additionally, residents of Ukiah erected a statue depicting White and Stainer escaping hand-in-hand, -hand, a symbol of their courage and resilience.